So it is an honor for us to have Professor Eileen Cowler from, Roger, from Rutgers University today in our Bar-Ilan University Vision Sciences Seminar. Professor Cowler has a BA in psychology from Queens University, and then she did a PhD in psychology at the University of Maryland at College Park. She then continued to do a postdoc at NYU, and then joined as faculty uh, in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers, where she is now a distinguished professor. She won multiple uh, awards, including uh, she's including being the winner of the Davida Teller Award of the Vision Sciences Society, but also she was awarded for um, uh, her research uh, for her teaching. Sorry. Yeah, for teaching. She has given multiple invited lectures and three keynote addresses. She's the current president of the Vision Sciences Society and has been for several years on its board of directors. She has taken multiple editorial roles in multiple vision and psychology related journals, in vision related grant study sections, committees, and others. Her research has thousands of citations. She published numerous research articles, including in top leading journals as Nature, Science, Nature and Neuroscience, Annual Review of Vision, Science and others, including influential reviews and book chapters, and also two books she edited. She is one of the key scientists in eye movement research. Her research focuses on predictive eye movements and the relationship between eye movements and attention. She initiated investigation of a novel, of a novel phenomenon known as the anticipatory smooth eye movements, where the eyes move smoothly and involuntarily before the target begins to move. And this leads to the question of how can the brain know what hasn't been seen yet? While there is so much more to say, I will stop here and let Professor Cowler tell us more herself about her research. Many thanks for joining us in our seminar. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for, for that uh, introduction. I, I now have to follow this with the talk. This is very hard, uh, but I appreciate it. And, and I certainly uh, enjoy seeing on the screen um, uh, some uh, old friends, so uh, hello, and, uh, and of course, uh, new ones. So I am going to start now, and let me just say that during the talk, uh, I do not um, object if someone unmutes and asks questions, so please go right ahead. But also, before I start, can I introduce Gia? Gia, can you wave? Uh, this is Gia Wong, who is a currently a, a doctoral student finishing her dissertation at Rutgers and Gia was kind enough to share her slides with me at, uh, that will make up a portion of the talk. Gia will jump in if I say something that is not accurate about, uh, about her work or uh, be available to handle um, uh, any uh, uh, questions you, you might want to ask about her portion. Uh, so I'm going to... Um, uh, begin and this should be the presentation. So there is no sound in this thing, so I don't need to check the sound box. All right, can you see the screen? Um, it the, just uh, start, yes, yeah. Okay, very good. So I'm going to start the slide and here we go. Okay, I need to minimize something so I can go on, very good. All right, so I'll be talking about the role of high and low level factors in smooth pursuit of predictable and random motions. And um, there is Gia, uh, another collaborator is Jason Rubenstein, whose doctoral work will be described here. He's now at Smith Kettlewell. And I will mentioning the work of a former student, Elio Santos, who is now a professor at uh, State University of New York at Oneonta. All right, so, um, as you can see here, it is uh, obvious the, um, it, the way in which human beings, when they just operate in the natural world, are going to be able to make predictions about future motion. No question. So the question here in this talk is how the oculomotor system, in particular smooth pursuit, is taking advantage of things that we already know. And of we meaning human beings when they interact in the world. All right, so ancient times. The first sign that I'll be talking about smooth pursuit eye movement. So here is a classical kind of paradigm, many of you are already familiar with, a target moving sinusoidally over time, horizontally, that's in green, 
and below this, a horizontal trace of the eye, which looks like it's following along and all that is fine, except for this weirdness here, which is that you could see that the eye turns around before the target. And phenomena like these, this kind of prediction, were noticed originally by Dodge in 1930, who reported them and basically said, well, that's, that's uh, interesting, you know, didn't quite know what to make of all this. And uh, Westheimer in 1954, who in conversations to me some years ago told me it was this kind of prediction that encouraged him to get out of the study of eye movements and move into the study of vision where you could at least use linear systems models to understand how the system worked. So uh, initially this kind of prediction was attributed to practice learning over and over tracking the same motion as is the case with these repetitive motions. My um, doctoral thesis actually, which uh, goes back a good many years prior to even the 1989 cited here, dealt with these kinds of predictive movements, which we called anticipatory smooth eye movements at the time. And what I'm showing here, not from the thesis, but from work a decade later, is uh, what happens when you smoothly pursue a disc moving down a clearly defined path and uh, where you know, without anyone telling you where this disc is likely to be going. And in these cases, you also get the anticipatory smooth movements and don't require the kind of repetitive pattern of motion that you do with the, um, with the sinusoids I showed earlier. And yet, this, uh, despite this, uh, certainly when I started out in the field, Studies of smooth pursuit continue to feature random target motions in an attempt to suppress prediction. Well, that, the, the things have changed considerably, fortunately, uh, over the years, but prediction uh, continues to be a tough problem. All right, so among the things, just uh, briefly, uh, these are, this is the uh, uh, velocity of anticipatory movements divided by stimulus velocity across a set of 21 subjects. So this is the only time I was able to actually measure in a large group, showing that there is some individual variation, but for the most part at the start of motion, people are going at about 30% of the upcoming speed of the target. Here's another thing always asked, do you get these movements on the first trial? So I had these 20 subjects, I averaged their performance for the first trial, and there it is. This is horizontal eye velocity to the left or right. When you're cued that the motion will be to the left or right, here's the onset, clear anticipatory movements. So whatever anybody might have learned, they already knew by the time they walked into the lab. So these are robust phenomena. They're not quirks of the smooth pursuit system. This is how it works. All right, why am I showing this slide? This slide is not for you to uh, worry about the details here, but real, this is the uh, diagram of the smooth pursuit pathways that appeared uh, some years ago in a review article by Rich Krausless. The point being the motion signals start here and the pursuit system goes through quite a long distance and an array of brain locations, including in frontal cortex, before it reaches the low level centers uh, right at the uh, pre, um, uh, uh, pre-motor areas to launch the, uh, the final response. So there is plenty of opportunity, and that's why I'm showing this, for pursuit to pick up information about expected target motion. So from a neural perspective, it certainly makes sense to treat the pursuit system as one that predicts, and yet it's difficult. All right, what I'm going to do now, there have, there have been lots of studies of anticipatory movements and predictive pursuit, including by some friends and colleagues whose faces I recognize in the, uh, in the uh, Zoom. And, uh, uh, but right now, I'm going to focus on four recent projects about prediction during pursuit, which we did in my, in my lab. We also, uh, uh, all right, so let me, let me uh, go on to the first. Pursuit is sensitive to the level of certainty about future motion. And this work actually was done by Elio Santos, who's uh, as part of his doctoral dissertation. So what uh, Elio uh, uh, and I did was ask what would happen if we introduce uncertainty. So up to this point in these slides that I've shown, 
you knew where the target was going to go 100%. But what if you were uncertain? Back in the old days, people would introduce some randomness in motion, target could go right or left in an effort to defeat prediction. They say, well, if you're not certain about the motion, we can just study the underlying visual motor circuitry. And as we know from studying vision, the visual system and the cognitive system are well equipped to deal with uncertainty. So why not the oculomotor pursuit system as well? So Elio looked at here two different ways of dealing with uncertainty. In one case, there's nothing marked, but what we were doing was using the proportion of trials moving to the right or left. So you might be in a session where say 75% of the time, the target moved to the right, 25% to the left. Here, it's a bit different. We used a visual cue, the, uh, the red in these bars to tell you the same probability. So obviously there's a difference because here we have a lot of consecutive trials with the same motion, but here we don't. And the question is what happens to anticipatory movements as a function of the proportion of trials here that the target was moving to the right. Under both of these paradigms, what I'm calling uncued, probably not the best term here, uh, but basically it's the memory condition where we didn't have a marker, but you knew by the proportion of prior trials where the target is likely to go and here the visual cue. And what happens is the anticipatory movements taken at the time of horizontal motion onset would be increasing in velocity, the more likely you expected rightward motion. And that occurred regardless of the cues. The only prominent difference in the two cases, interestingly, was in the 100% case where you got somewhat faster anticipatory movements when you're tracking the same thing over and over again, which means either the learning itself made a difference, just doing the same thing over and over again, or you didn't have to work as hard to keep track. Things became more automatic. In the visual cue condition, you actually had to take note of the cue in order to get these effects. But the point being that increasing uncertainty does to the pursuit system, to the anticipatory portion, basically what you would expect from our knowledge about the effects of uncertainty in perceptual decisions, for example. So just by making targets random, we don't get rid of prediction and prediction operates in what appears to be a rational way. Now, in part two of Santos's work, okay, part two of Santos's work, he did something else. He, uh, he went back to this paradigm I showed earlier where there is a strong perceptual cue that tells you if the motion will be to the right or to the left. He also used the somewhat weaker, but nevertheless vivid cue, an arrow pointing to the right or to the left, and looked at valid and invalid trials. To answer a question that, that uh, was sort of lingering in the background for a long time. In other words, what happens if this target actually crashes through this uh, visual barrier? So we had some portion of valid trials, some portion of invalid trials, and uh, asked about the effects of Q validity. So when the Q, these are four different subjects, we actually had about eight of them. When uh, the Q was the arrow, by um, reducing certainty, so you were a, a mixture of cases where there was uh, valid and invalid trials, the, um, the uh, anticipatory smooth eye movements are a bit uh, weaker, but they're still there. We, we showed this statistically. They're certainly strong in the 100% cases when you know whether the target will be moving in or opposite to the direction pointed to by the arrow. That's shown here by the big difference between anticipatory smooth eye movements to the left and right. The barrier coup was interesting. There was a clear bias to obey the direction shown by the cue. So if you are 100% valid, you got strong anticipatory smooth eye movements shown by the big difference between left and right. If you are 100% uh, invalid, essentially, where you always crash through the barrier, the anticipatory movements were weaker, even though you knew what was happening. So this is an interesting result that tells us that there are two kinds of processes operating here to determine your belief about the future motion. 
Again, not totally surprising given what we know about other aspects of perceptual decisions, but interesting to see this in the pursuit system. And one process is operating on past history because clearly there's an effect of cue validity with both cues, but there's also seems to be some kind of embedded or natural belief to follow the perceptual configuration. Uh, the, the barrier is interpreted in a way that seems to be immune to whatever we do during the um, few hundred trials of running. All right, so we leave this showing that there is an effect of certainty on the anticipatory movements of smooth pursuit. Okay, let me just hold here, take a sip of tea and uh, say that this is study one of four. And also I want to check that I'm doing okay on time. There is something where you lose track of it a bit looking at your, uh, your own slides on the screen. All right, so now maybe go at slightly different pace and talk about more recent work, uh, three studies that have not been published yet, although we are working on it. And the second one is work done as part of Jason Rubenstein's thesis. Jason, as I mentioned earlier, is now at Sleep Kettlewell. And this project deals with the effect of the level of certainty about the future motion and the level of certainty about your immediate motion combining in proportion to their respective reliabilities. Okay, so this is really a extension of, uh, or the next stages, I should say, in the uh, work by Santos. So following with what the, the, uh, you might expect, given that the smooth system is capable of anticipating, but also is influenced by immediate motion, we have these two major influences operating, the predictability and information about the current direction of the stimulus to determine the direction of smooth pursuit. And the question really that has made this whole topic of pursuit and prediction very difficult is knowing that both of these things contribute, but not quite knowing how. And this, these studies will address this question, not provide obviously a, a complete answer, but hopefully steps along the way. This is very challenging. There are two different kinds of inputs. One is right there in front of you and visual, and the other is somehow internally represented. Okay, and I should, I should just add that the nice things about studying this in these kinds of combinations in pursuit is that a lot is known about, as I showed earlier, the neural pathway. So if you could really understand the rules by which these two combine, you, there might be a, a, a good chance of understanding where this information comes in along the pathway for pursuit. Okay, so uh, obviously you have realized that um, this whole topic brings to mind Bayesian Q combination where the um, uh, predictable aspects of the motion could be characterized by the average direction, so that's uh, shown here, and the variability of direction. And the actual, uh, sorry, let me back up. Okay, this would be the average direction you would expect and the variability of your expectation. So if you drew, which we're going to do, the direction of target motion from a distribution, a Gaussian distribution, it would have these parameters representing the mean and the variance. The same thing would be true of the actual direction of motion. We're gonna be using random dot fields where the motion will be in a certain direction and have a certain variability. And hopefully these two will combine in some lawful way to produce the actual direction of the eye at any given point in time. And that's what uh, Rubenstein's thesis is here going to investigate. Now, I should say that in the course of this work, we are not by no means the only ones to talk about Bayesian Q combination of pursuit. And here are four examples, and I hope I'm not leaving any prominent uh, examples out, but these are the the four that, um, that are, uh, have, have really um, discussed this topic in depth with very different approaches or bon divri to using 
simulations, Montanini, Darlington, Lisberger, and Derive, uh, having experimental data using very different configurations of stimuli, uh, in many cases using contrast as a way to vary the certainty of motion about actual direction. Well, Rubenstein and I took a, a somewhat different approach by using random dot kinematographs, which is a stimulus that has been used uh, often for the study of smooth pursuit, including I saw Scott here in the, in the group, Scott uh, Watanamiuk, and uh, he has used this uh, quite often. All right, so let's go. Um, the first experiment is going to keep the predictability of motion constant and vary instead the, uh, uh, the noise attached to the stimulus motion. Okay, so here, let's see if this works, is a random dot kinematogram. And this is our clear motion, and there it is. So all the dots moving in one direction. So that's the clear case. And here in the next slide is the noisy motion. And there it goes. Okay, very nice. So I should mention parenthetically that you don't, as you know, certainly those who have studied pursuit or other types of motor behavior or any kind of visual experiment, you don't just wake up one day and say, I think I'll do it this way with so many dots and uh, a certain intensity and a certain size field. So Jason and I spent a lot of time looking at these settings because this is gonna be an intense experiment. You need a lot of trials to be able to get an interpretable result. And it's always possible you could pick a condition where the effects will be harder to elicit than in others. So we tried different combinations. It didn't seem to matter much what we did with dot density or dot uh, the field size and so on. So we just went on. You also, and those out here in the, uh, uh, who are doing eye movement work are aware that not everyone has the patience to sit through and run in these experiments. We clearly needed people who were not informed by the hypothesis, uh, but also people who did not have long eyelashes that could he keep their head still on a chin rest for some period of time, that didn't wear glasses or contact lenses, and could be counted on to reliably show up in the lab a few times a week and sit through patiently an hour long session. So we are, uh, we are running our naive subjects and grateful that we were able to find uh, people to work with us. Uh, the author actually, other collaborator, Manish Singh from Rutgers uh, who worked with us on this uh, project. So as I mentioned, we have a clear and noisy random dot kinematogram. We start with the uh, uh, stationary field where you're fixating in the middle, then uh, start the trial by a button press. The field remains static for another second and then begins to move in whatever direction it's going to move for uh, one and a half seconds. At the end of the trial, we did something which we didn't have to because we didn't analyze the data. We asked people to use an, uh, this pointer to tell us the direction of motion of the RDK. We basically did this as somewhat of a motivating task so that they would hopefully pay attention more to the motion if they had to uh, report it uh, at the end. But these data are really not gonna tell us much because by the end of the trial, the eye is already pursued to the end and you could use the eye itself as uh, a, um, a cue about uh, where you think the motion was. So we really did this to keep people paying attention. All right, um, and so, okay, so some preliminary slides just to show you that people indeed did, did pursue, these were three observers, subjects, and this is pursued speed over time, and uh, from all of our various conditions, clear and noisy random dot kinematograms, and I should say that in this particular slide, I have a couple of versions of these, uh, we did uh, two different experiments. In one of them, the direction of motion on each trial was drawn from a fairly narrow distribution. So you can see the sigma sub p is 10 degrees. This was the standard deviation of the prior, right? This is the, this is the telling us that the actual directions of motion were tested, sorry, clustered 
very uh, highly against the mean, whereas in the other case, the prior was uh, uh, much broader and there was considerable more variability. So I'll be talking about these two conditions here. So uh, in these cases, this is simply to show that we got vigorous pursued speed that reached its, um, its peak value at about 200 milliseconds, which is what you'd expect, some overshoot, and then sits around steady state. And uh, we did, I don't want to go into this right now, but uh, we did a bit of speed uh, match scaling here. You actually, uh, for the noisy ones, had to use um, uh, bigger jumps per uh, frame to get equivalent I speeds, which is what we did. Okay, and these, these are the mu's and means of the prior. All right, so let's go on. This is mean I, oh, forgot to say, here is the clear, um, uh, there is clear anticipation. Your, your speed is above zero, even at motion onset. And here we find that the average pursuit direction over time, again, at the beginning is close to the mean of the prior. So that's what you expect from the anticipation and then um, uh, levels off and becomes closer to the prior actually when you have real information. Now, here's what Jason did for the analysis. He took 100 millisecond samples of I speed and at different periods of time. So here is three representative periods, the onset of motion, 150 milliseconds later, 300 milliseconds later. And this is a scatter plot of the direction of the RDK on each trial against the direction of the eye. So at zero milliseconds, it's a mess, which is what you'd expect. And the average is close to the mean of the prior. By 150 milliseconds, the actual direction of motion on the trial begins to be influential. And by 300 milliseconds, you're doing very well. So you have basically a slope of uh, close to one. And what we'll be doing right now, in the slides I'll be showing, is looking at the slope as the main indication of how you make the transition from depending initially only on the prediction to eventually depending on the actual direction of motion. So these are plots of the slope of the regression lines you just saw over time for two cases. The blue is the clear random dot patterns. The uh, red is the noisy random dot patterns. And these error bars are actually confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. So looking at this, what we're seeing is what you would expect from the Bayesian prediction, namely that we reach a slope of one much earlier for the clear than for the noisy RDK. So there is a considerable gap between these two functions, telling us the first part of our prediction of Bayesian Q combination is holding, namely the system is relying more on the actual stimulus motion when the reliability of that motion is greater. So this is one part of the result. And I have to say again, it's one thing to say that this is what the kind of thing people have found in Bayesian Q combination experiments earlier. And certainly we modeled a lot of this uh, from Kerning and Walport's work. It's another thing to go through all the steps you need and actually see this result. There were loads of reasons why we might not uh, get it, including people just not paying attention to anything, but that didn't happen. All right, so let's go on to the next part. Now we're gonna look at what happens when we vary the predictability of the stimulus. And uh, here we go. So on the left are the results from the clear RDK. And this is comparing the highly predictable uh, to the less predictable. So the highly predictable is the lighter blue and the uh, less predictable purple. And they're doing about the same. When we get to the noisy R, because here in the clear RDK, you really depend on the actual stimulus. Predictability has a much greater influence when we look at the noisy RDK, when the results are showing what you would expect. Namely, you reach a slope of one earlier when the stimulus is less predictable. So again, this result, I saw it and just knocked me over with the feather. You know, it was not necessarily what you would expect uh, uh, to see, not because of the Bayesian principles, but because there it is in smooth pursuit. So, 
So we have really both sides of these results. And I have to say, this guy on the bottom, he, uh, Jason, we ran some of these after Jason started his postdoc. We had to change some of the trivial aspects of the conditions that we had seen um, uh, needed to be uh, cleaned up. So I had to run three naive subjects and uh, we ran up to March 13, 2020. That was lockdown day. And fortunately had just enough trials from everybody to be able to uh, uh, do the analysis. Okay, so pursuit follows principles of Bayesian Q combination. Prior and likelihood combine according to their respective reliabilities. Now, Jason and I are working on one final aspect of this project, which may or may not succeed. So we are, we are trying to uh, work it through. And that is to see if we can fit the data with the recursive Bayesian model. And in that meaning that the, um, the direction of the eye at any given point in time is a combination of two things, the predicted direction here on the left and the actual direction of the stimulus. Now, what we're doing here in this, uh, in this attempt at modeling is to assume that on the very first timestamp, the prediction is governed by the prior, but on each successive timestamp, the prior is embodied by the eye movement itself, the eye direction itself on the previous time interval. Now, I'm not gonna have a lot to say about this because this work is still in progress, meaning that I got the recent update from Jason a half hour or whatever, last night actually before this talk. So we are um, really doing it right now, but I'm going to include something preliminary. And I should mention here that all I'm showing you is a simulation. And in the simulation, just trying to see whether in principle we can recreate the data, the slope data I showed you earlier. And uh, all of these three things, the three things not circled here, uh, we can estimate either from the data or from the actual direction of motion. What we have no idea about is, and what we we'll have to estimate from the data, is the variability of the sense direction. And you can't just use the variability of the random dots to do it because there's all kinds of variability coming from the actual sensory processing itself. So that parameter is the one that we have to fiddle with to get this, uh, to get a simulation that looks like an approximation of the data. We don't know in advance what it should look like, but we are interested in testing one hypothesis, not so much the parameter value itself, but we can say it should be the same whether or not you're in the highly predictable motion or the noisy motion. In other words, the variability of the sensory analysis of the stimulus shouldn't depend on the level of predictability. These things should be, according to this model, independent. So all I'm showing you here, and I emphasize the in progress, and this is mine, this is not coming out of Jason, this was just a uh, demonstration, the concept will work. If we make the assumption that this uh, sigma noise is going to decrease over time as you acquire more samples. We asked, could we reproduce the changes in slopes over time? And yes, we do a, a fairly good job in all four conditions, two kinds of uh, RDK levels of noise and for our narrow and wide priors. And with, in, these, in this simulation, with the uh, uh, constraint that the noise parameter for the uh, stimulus for the sensory motion is the same for both narrow and wide prior. So if we can accomplish that, then we would have, uh, we would have uh, I think said something about optimal Q combination being a relevant concept to smooth pursuit. So there we go, we have data and perhaps a simulation showing that smooth pursuit follows principles of Bayesian Q combination, prior and likelihood combine according to their respective reliabilities. Okay. Very good. So stopping here is, I, I, I don't wanna get into a long discussion, but are there any questions about these two projects up to this point? Because they really deal with certainty when I get to the next part, you'll be shifting emphasis a bit. 
So does anyone want to unmute and make a comment or ask, a, ask something that I might need to clarify or account for? This is just like teaching. I have no idea who's out there or what's going on. All right. Okay. So uh, I will uh, go on. Okay. So that's fine. All right. Gia, you're out there. Should I go on? Sure. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to get now to Gia Wong's uh, work that's uh, going to make up her doctoral dissertation, which is in progress. Okay, and project three. Now, this will not immediately seem to connect to prediction when I start talking about it, but I will uh, assure you that the implications are there. Pursuit, like other motor activities, shows strong relationships between the geometry and the kinematics of motion. All right, so here we go. So here is just a slide with a result that I showed you early. And that is the average velocity, horizontal velocity of the eye in this paradigm where the target is gonna move along a highly predictable path. And here we have the anticipation starting at, uh, by the time the horizontal component of motion starts. Well. So a story, when I had the results in various versions of this over the years, never looked at the vertical motion because it seemed to me to be pointless and uninformative. And why? Because look, the vertical here is very fast and then it's simply going to slow down because now you're gonna have an oblique path. So the vertical component will actually be in the stimulus slower, which it was. So I said, well, what's the point of looking at the vertical? There's nothing to analyze there. But one day, for whatever reason, I said, okay, it's time to look at the vertical. So I look at this thing and it comes out. I remember sitting in the lab at night and looking at it. And what happened was the vertical, sure, it slowed down, but it slowed down too much, too much. Now I look at this, what, what was going on here? I'm not showing you this, this slide, but I'm telling you that it was, I said, this is really weird. Now, why was that happened? Well, it shouldn't have been a surprise. And I immediately thought of Pablo, uh, Paolo Viviani and, uh, Paolo Vi and the, um, the uh, two thirds parallel, which of course is what we were running into. Okay, and here is where Gia begins to uh, uh, enter the picture. And of course, the first thing we did was check Viviani's work, including Desperati and Viviani, 1997, who demonstrated the two-thirds power law for pursuit. Now, for those of you who are not, uh, have, haven't looked up the two-thirds power law lately, I will provide a, uh, a background. So this is um, the experiment that uh, Gia was working on. And here we have a target moving along a path where there is a sharp change in direction. In Disparati and Viviani, they used a uh, targets moving in repetitive ellipses. Now we didn't do this repetitively. These were separate trials. It's just the movie is looping around. And this example is nice because it shows the slowdown I was referring to. The vertical motion, sure, you go down, you go up, you change vertical direction. That's on the bottom. Horizontal velocity is totally unchanged throughout this path. You're still moving in this example to the left but here's the slowdown right at the turning point. And this is the reminiscent of the two thirds power law. In the two thirds power law, Viviani in many papers and others have uh, replicated and extended, showed a relationship between the curvature of the motion and the speed. So in general, here, here is quantitatively, the law that there is a relationship between um, the radius of curvature and velocity with the power uh, raised to the uh, uh, two thirds, the parameter beta here is two thirds. And the point being, when you're going around a tight curve, you slow down. And that's what the arm does. There are also perceptual phenomena that uh, show this kind of thing affects your perception of constant velocity. But uh, uh, other than Desperati and Viviani, to my knowledge, nobody has looked at this in smooth pursuit and certainly not in the absence of the kind of repetitive elliptical motion that they were studying. 
So here is back to uh, Gia's project where she's looking at two different kinds of motion. One was a highly predictable case where the path was marked literally by this line. And the other was unpredictable where the target starts out from any location along the perimeter, goes to the center, makes a turn, and then uh, returns to another location on the perimeter. The turn angles were the critical variables here at the lower right. And we got everywhere from zero, meaning no turn, to 180 degrees, meaning as soon as you reach the center, you turn around and go back to where you started. Okay, so what happens? All right, well, one of the things we find, not surprisingly, is the slowdown that I talked about around the time of the turn. So in the case where you don't know the turn uh, angle in advance, where it's unmarked, you right after the target turns, the eye has to change direction and it slows down depending on the steepness of the angle. So here it is reaching its lowest speed about 100 milliseconds or so after the target changes direction, then it goes up to top speed. And I'll just mention in passing another result, which is, uh, you know, it's one of these things. If you study smooth pursuit, you might expect that the target is going to reach its peak velocity uh, right after the, uh, um, you know, at 200 milliseconds, such as the date I showed earlier. But this time, you know, you're going to turn around and slow down. So the eye wastes no time in preparing for that, hundreds of milliseconds in advance. Does the same thing at the end. Here we have the predictable case, the same slowdown, except it occurs, as you might expect, closer to the time of the actual turn. And the decrease in speed is, of course, uh, modulated by the expected turn angle. So, so the um, uh, makes sense uh, up to this point. Uh, another characteristic, actually, um, uh, Engel and Sichting reported results similar to these as well at about 2000. And these are changes of uh, direction over time, the unpredictable, predictable, showing that the amount of time taken to execute the full change in direction is actually about the same in the, for the different turn angles, which is a, uh, a relationship that Viviani talked about, he called isochrony, as one of the advantages of the two thirds power law that you can uh, complete the adjust angular velocity. So you complete the turn in about the same time, regardless of the turn angle. All right, now what Gia then did is ask the question, does the two thirds power law really fit these data? And that required measuring both the curvature of the eye positions at the time of the turn, as well as velocity. Well, velocity we've done uh, many times. Curvature, uh, Gia worked out uh, with um, uh, and discovering some uh, algorithm for curvature estimation, radius of curvature apply these to the actual change in direction of the eye. And I should say the only thing we could really do here was use those trials where there were no, uh, no cetates. And uh, basically uh, it's a very straightforward algorithm requiring finding three points and um, uh, estimating this triangle and the circumscribed circle. But if there was a cicade intervening, we didn't use those trials. Yeah, maybe you could, wiggle around and correct for it, but uh, these trials were much uh, cleaner and uh, didn't risk uh, uh, contamination by any algorithm we'd introduced to correct for cicades. So basically here is the result, which is the two thirds power law holes for pursuit under these conditions. So here is on the X axis, the radius of curvature to uh, power of one third and um, uh, Gia went and uh, plotted these, and this is velocity on the y-axis, and uh, Gia was able to find that the best-fitting uh, estimates of the parameter beta were about two-thirds, as, um, as uh, has been found for many types of motor systems, but also now for these kinds of pursuit movements during these sharp turns, predictable and unpredictable. And here is uh, also the, uh, there's a second parameter, which is uh, um, uh, varies a bit, I believe, depending on the uh, different conditions, but not too much. So um, 
uh, here are scatter plots showing that actually different curvatures cluster at different um, points along the scatter plot, but all are, are falling along the same line. So the two thirds power law holds for smooth pursuit. So that's very nice. And what's the significance of finding that? Well, a couple of things. One is, it's very nice that pursuit does the same thing that almost everything else does. The other thing it says is that there is something built into pursuit that adjusts its kinematics to those of motions of living things, because that's where we find the two thirds parallel. And why is that a good thing? Well, you could think of this in some way as pursuit having a built-in prior. You know, people who talk about decision making talk about these built-in uh, natural priors that people may have. Well, in a sense, this is a built-in motor prior for pursuit that basically says we are set up to pursue natural biological motions, which are arguably the most important ones. And if pursuit evolved to predict for some reason, it wasn't to be able to track. I don't know, airplanes as they uh, move through the sky. Okay, the final part, and I'm always aware of my timing here, so I think I've got it, is Smooth Pursuit Knows Physics. Okay, so that's my short form title. And this is the other part of GS thesis work. And now we're going in a somewhat different direction. We are still gonna involve turns, targets changing direction, but now coming from different uh, sources. So here is, hopefully this works. So what you're supposed to be doing here is looking at the red target, which is going, but not ignoring the white one, which is going to be hit by this uh, white target, the launcher, and then follow a path in this example, consistent with Newtonian mechanics. And I should say a prior uh, paper by Badler and Heinen investigated such collisions our paradigm here and conditions are somewhat different. So here is our case on the left that is consistent with Newtonian mechanics. And then the one on the right, which is the non-Newtonian, obviously that's the weird one. Okay, so we're comparing pursuit of the red target in, in both Newtonian and non-Newtonian to see whether the eye can make a prediction about the likely path of motion. And the way that uh, Gia did this is she blocked the trial. So you run a block of Newtonian or a block of non-Newtonian. In other words, assuming that learning is possible, even in the weird one at the right, we wanna compare the extent to which the Newtonian beliefs on the left act to enhance the learning. So do you do, we assumed you'd probably be able to predict in both, but can you predict better in the case of the Newtonian? There are other paradigms one could use for this, but the learning I thought got it up front. It could be wrong on this, but that was uh, that would get it up front what the um, what the role of uh, learning was, so we could see what prediction did on top of this. Okay, so uh, this these results were presented at. Um, uh, 2021 and uh, with collaboration edition of Dee and Domini. And uh, so um, uh, here we go. So I, you know, I mentioned I was responsible for the learning aspect because it's the one aspect that maybe you could say, yeah, we should have used a different paradigm. So if that doesn't work, that's my fault. Okay, so here is just an illustration of what you saw earlier, the target uh, reaching a collision point. L is the launcher, T is the target you're pursuing and it could move in either Newtonian or non-Newtonian pathways. And just to mix things up a bit, there were two collision points. Okay, so here are results. And uh, let's see what I'm showing here. What I'm showing is over time, I velocity. Uh, this could either be horizontal or vertical. It would be in, in, in the critical direction here, depending, because they're all different start points of the launcher and, uh, and everything was rotated so that the directions would be as, uh, as shown here. So uh, in this case, the Newtonian, the Newtonian motion would be to the left, the non-Newtonian would be to the right. And this graph is showing the Newtonian using the solid lines 
the non-Newtonian in the dash lines. So if we, and here is time zero, this basically right here is when the launcher hits the target. So the, the, uh, this little dotted line is a neutral condition where there was no launcher. Well, in the absence of the launcher, you're sitting there at zero and the eye then eventually pursues the way you would expect after its latency period. In the case of the non-Newtonian, that's the dash. So that was all the trials going to the right shown here. There is some prediction because you learned it. So there's a little anticipation, but it's not much. In the case of the Newtonian, the anticipation was as expected much greater. All right, here is a summary of these results showing average eye speed over time for the neutral, and this was uh, taken at three different time periods, 100 milliseconds before the crash, the crash, and 100 milliseconds after. This is the neutral case. This is the non-Newtonian is dash, so the eye speeds are slower, and the Newtonian is, uh, is faster still. There are other data, which I believe I am not showing here today, showing the, the, the learning in the non-Newtonian, which was clear, not so much in the Newtonian, there you hit it pretty much off the bat, and also showing that the relative variability of the eye velocity was smaller in the case of the Newtonian. So the prediction here not only allowed you to have faster anticipatory eye movements, it also didn't require as much learning, and it reduced the variability. So the main conclusion from results like these is that built in to the eye movement system, the pursuit system, is what you know, namely knowledge of where a target is likely to go after a crash. Uh, GIA is working on currently extending these to somewhat different pathways of motion and uh, considering other types of cues. So there's always something funny about the pursuit system because you can ask, well, how much physics does the pursuit system know? <laughs> does it really know as much as we are capable of learning? And there are very interesting questions uh, along those lines. Um, okay, so I believe this is, this is a, maybe a hair early, but that's probably okay. Uh, I will now go to the final conclusions and see what we have learned from all this or what we haven't learned from all this. Smooth pursuit responds on the basis of expected future motion. Second, the role of immediate sensors. Now here's a conclusion. Uh, the pursuit was and continues to be considered as a system that has a reactive part of itself. In other words, an automaticity that will react even in cases where things are totally random. We can get at the underlying visual motor part of the system. So that, that uh, idea still continues to um, um, exist within, within the study of the system. But maybe we should now start saying that a bit differently or thinking about it differently, rather than thinking about the visual stimulus as a control system within linear systems model, but really think about what the visual stimulus does at any point in time is to update your prediction. Because what pursuit really wants to do is not so much follow the motion because then it's too late if it's following the motion. The motion is already long gone by the time pursuit catches up. But what it's doing is constantly trying to predict the motion using what it has available and using the sensory errors that it makes, because there will be no predictions are perfect. Even those that seem like they're gonna be perfect aren't in the real world, nothing is perfect. But using the sensory motion to update the prediction so that produce, the pursuit produces a response that best captures the most likely future motion. Three, all types of cues, well, all is too strong, we haven't studied them all, Cues, various types of cues, can generate predictions about future motion, including cues derived from memory for the recent past, perceptual cues different, of different types, or cues that take advantage of knowledge of Newtonian mechanics. And it is interesting, I think, to know what kinds of cues 
are uh, available to influence pursuit. And finally, the compliance with the two thirds power law implies that pursuit may be best suited to track the motions of living things, probably one of the most important reasons we need a pursuit system in the first place. So I have um, uh, been around long enough to watch the evolution of the study of pursuit go from one that really um, emphasized very basic linear systems models, thinking that prediction was somehow a um, random box somehow somewhere, that we will figure out one day how to plug in to reversing this and thinking about pursuit as primarily a predictive system that basically is sitting there operating in the same brain that knows a lot of things about using cues and past history to make at least a reliable short-term prediction about the future. And the hope is we can understand the rules by which this predictive system operates and how they're implemented in the brain. Okay, that is my story today. And once again, acknowledging the work of uh, the uh, students, former students uh, who have uh, contributed uh, to these, uh, to these projects, contributed, did these projects. All right, so I am going to stop here. Should I keep the share on? I don't know, what's the, uh, what is the- Whatever you decide is fine. So, uh, but first, uh, whatever you decide, I wanna uh, invite everybody to unmute yourself and let's uh, give a big applause uh, to Professor Lee Fowler for uh, the wonderful talk. And I would like to open the stage for questions. I have a few of my own, but I'll let uh, others speak. And there's also, if you can see the chat, or do you want me to read from the chat? There are also two or three. Yes, um, probably that would be safer, yeah. If I read it. Yes, yes, I could hit the wrong thing and then I'm gone. So okay. I don't wanna, I don't wanna so, do it. Yeah, 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 sure. So um, uh, there's a question, does the Obert Fleischel phenomenon confound the two thirds power law for smooth pursuit. This is the. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> can I can I hear more about what the what the um, what is motivating that uh, question? Okay, so uh, Rajul Suans, uh, if you would like to unmute yourself and explain, or maybe later. Um, the, the um, next question is asked by Hagit, and uh, did you test performance of individuals who do not follow typical Bayesian behavior in cognitive tasks such as uh, ASD? If so, do they fail in pursuit behavior as well? So back in 2013 with Cordelia Aitken and Elio uh, we, uh, Santos, we did a study of um, uh, what I believe it was 13 high functioning individuals with ASD who showed identical performance to our neurotypical uh, subjects. Now, what would happen with other populations of, uh, of uh, non-neurotypical people uh, is, is obviously an, uh, an important question, particularly those, um, I mean, one can, can name, you know, what, what and, and the other part of this also is in, in these kinds of studies, can we do something helpful or useful in understanding the basis of different kinds of non-neurotypical situations? So it's, it's an extremely important issue. Testing children is, is, would be quite interesting. But, but you know, I have to emphasize that in experiments like this, you need people who are prepared to have patience and cooperation. Otherwise, you could get you won't necessarily get pursuit. Nobody has to pursue. They have to want to do it. They have to pay sufficient attention to the motion. And the question of what we do with pursuit in the real, in the natural environment when we are just going about the daily life is a question that has not been answered because the instrumentation to get the precise measurements, uh, there, there are very few good ways to do that without introducing a lot of noise. So a lot of these questions are very hard to answer for these, these methodological reasons. Okay, th there are um, a few more in the chat, but I will uh, we'll get to them later. Um, Jeremy, would you like to uh, ask a question? Sure, hi, Eileen. Um, so I'm wondering whether or not you can make predictions about more than one item at a time or whether 
you're only making these sort of uh, predictions about the current object of attention and perhaps fixation. Yeah. I think that's that's a great question because um, it opens up all kinds of issues about what's happening at the short term and the role of memory and just the role of executive function in launching these movements. So there has to be some narrowing of the path. So are you combining different predictions? How complicated can this get? I think that's what you're going at, Jim, Jeremy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. Yeah, so this is uh, the absolutely beautiful questions. And you know, you could ask this about anything people do, right? If they're if they're planning a path, how much information can you take in at once to make the optimal decision? And what from the pursuit perspective is optimal, right? And we don't even know that. You can't even say that optimal pursuit uh, with confidence. You can't say that what the pursuit system really wants to do is follow a target and match its velocity. I don't know that that's what it wants to do. That's what everybody you know, assumes <laughs> since, since the Stone Age. But, but maybe that's not true because look at the results from, from a GS experiment uh, with the direction change. The pursuit starts to slow down really early. Well, if it's really critical to match velocity because what, a vision? You wouldn't do that, presumably. You just stay with it and then say, okay, I'll make the sharp turn when the time comes. But the system's not doing that. So the question of, of over what time scale pursuit wants to accomplish whatever it is it wants to accomplish, these are questions we don't know the answer to. And, and thank you for asking this, Jeremy. So I got to make this little speech, but because because what, what I, I think we're doing is seeing the long range value of viewing pursuit as a predictive system. Because if you didn't view it as a predictive system, you wouldn't be asking any of these questions. And I think we're opening up to using pursuit to study many of the same things that we study when we study perceptual decisions in the context of perceptual judgments or motor behavior. It's part of that package and it has to coordinate with these or you get nothing. But, all right, go ahead, let's go to the next. Yes, I could talk much longer about this, yeah. Um, is that okay, Jeremy? Is that, does that address? I, I, there, there looks like there's a bunch of, uh, I've got follow-ups too, but let's okay. come back to it later. All right, this is fun. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, thank you both. Okay, so uh, one question in the chat by Eliran was uh, whether there are aging effects on uh, successful, uh, um, <laughs> successful uh, pursuit. Uh, if if I can uh, manage to get a good signal from the uh, eye tracker, I will let you know. <laughs> I can be the. <laughs> So I think there are probably aging effects on everything, but um, our subjects were uh, uh, were general college age. I don't know the oldest person uh, recently was probably in the in their thirties. So I I would expect there'd be there'd be various things. I mean, you know, pursuit is along with everything else. I suspect there would be changes, but I don't know. These are again hard experiments to run because you have to rule out the results might do to some to be just some methodological things about the level of cooperation. And you really have to worry about head stability with pursuit also. So you've got to get, if, if somebody is doing this, you, you're going to have problems. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, Crystal Hexlin um, is asking, is saying, fascinating talk, thank you. How robust are pursuit prediction abilities to pathology or visual processing? Again, I, I don't know, you know, but there, there are some studies that, that are out there. There are people studying pursuit uh, with people with Parkinson's, with dementia. There are a work out at Smith Kettlewell that uh, Jason Rubenstein is initiating uh, dealing with pursuit with people who have different kinds of visual disorders. So uh, there has have been studies uh, at Smith Kettlewell with uh, Preeti Vergais uh, looking at people with uh, macular degeneration who are using the uh, alternative uh, foveas. So um, it's ongoing. There's, there is there is no end to this. But again, maybe part of the prediction is to compensate for a visual visual information that may be poor because of your own visual uh, conditions. 
I agree, Eileen, and, and I appreciate that. I actually, my curiosity here was also to do with how quickly does the system adapt to change? You know, does it change its priors quickly or does it take a long time? Um, you know, if somebody had normal vision most of their life, all of a sudden they lose some processing, some of the processing ability. How quickly yeah. does this, this system yeah. adapt? Yeah. So bo both pursuit as for its own sake, but also as an indicator. And uh, it's a, so it's a very visual, obvious indicator of uh, of uh, various things going on in the brain. So it's a great, great question, a great question. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we were studying these, as you could see, it, it took a lot to get to get to this point and uh, looking for conditions. So we didn't want to mess with the prior. So, for example, in Jason's experiment with the random dots, the first session you ran was always 50 trials with the clear random dot kinematograms, which we didn't analyze, that didn't count. And that was to give you uh, exposure to the, uh, to the prior for that, for that day. And we didn't uh -huh. mess with it in the same day because then the question of how quickly you can change. But given, look at uh, Elio's, uh, Santos's result where you could just show the cue and there you can, you can change on a dime. So you can do sure. it, but, but you've got you to, plug into it. You can, you've got to pay some degree of attention to the cues to get, to get the result. So that's in part why we use those cues in that experiment. You don't need to have the practice, but in terms of learning priors, I mean, when you don't have a cue, that's, that's a real question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I have um, uh, well, actually two questions. Uh, um, I'll just, yeah. anyway, the first one is about 3D, uh, whether- oh my God. Uh, <laughs> whether because uh, here basically uh, the, the paradigms are mostly uh concentrated on a flat screen uh yeah. if i understand correctly which is um a uh, very limited or very partial uh landscape relative to what we're actually used to be doing in a real world where we also have to change the depth or the distance from us so i was wondering if you think these uh, results generalize uh, and of course in a 3d world we have many more trajectories to take into account when we follow and the other one was uh about statistics uh with the predictability and the fact that you show um that when you uh, when pe when subjects learn, they actually learn in a way or partial uh, learning of even things that don't really exist in the real world. Well, if you train, first of all, if you looked at the beginning versus the end of those learning effects, and whether they were like if you would look only at the beginning where uh, participants were not yet maybe familiar with the statistics, whether the effects yeah. would be different than at the end of the experiment. And also what would happen if you train much more or if you train in various uh, unpredicted ways uh, or non-physical ways, would you still, uh, would you think you would get similar results? Yeah, so, so I think um, what you'd have to do, I'll answer the second one, is you'd have to change the, um, you'd have to change the di prior distribution in the middle of the, of the sequence of trials and then see what happens. So the thing that makes these hard to address with pursuit is how long can somebody sit there without taking a break? And if, you know, in the old days, I, used to, I, I was running in everything and my vision now doesn't allow, it's not the age, it's really the vision. And I would, uh, we did an experiment on saccadic adaptation back, uh, Dan Paul's thesis in, in 1999. And I, I was determined, the, I, I didn't ask anybody to sit for longer than 125, but I sat for 325 because of why, I don't remember. There was some good reason for this, but, <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, so now I'm so cautious about this because people are coming in that a naive subject and they really sit 40, 50 trials, and we get it, get off the chin rest, recalibrate, do it again. So we'd have to get a design that was just less fragile with respect to tolerating these kinds of frequent breaks, because I don't, I don't trust running. And people just lose it after a while. They got to get up and they got to walk around. So it's a great question, very hard. It really requires. In, in, in my next life, uh, it would be 
the using a video instrument that doesn't exist now, but it would give you high resolution. So you could just measure what happens when people are walking around. Because, you know, I will mention that for Gia, who's sitting here, our master's thesis dealt with a project where we expected to see smooth pursuit help you in the visual judgment. And in that, people didn't pursue the way we expected. And there were other tasks reported where people prefer to use saccades, eye hand coordination. That's where you'd expect to see pursuit. You're trying to move the hand to, but nah, they don't do it. They look at the end goal and the hand sort of goes on its own. Well, what do we do with pursuit is, is a really fundamental question. So if we could know that we put them in a natural environment where we get it, we can answer uh, various questions like these. And, the, and that goes with the question about 3D. We need the instrumentation to be able to do it. Uh, the, best, the best systems now are coil systems and Michaela Ruki has, has the best one up in Rochester to be able to, but you have to wear an attachment to the eye. So you're not fully free to navigate. You're freer than you are uh, when you're sitting on a chin rest. So the technical load here is, is just uh, limitations are significant, but you, there's still a lot you could do despite that. So, you know, I'd say if we have good theories of how things work, that would be a real achievement. Thank you. Um, uh, let's hear at uh, the audience. There are two uh, more questions, but um, I will let other people ask and then um, Okay, so um, the, the earlier question about the Obert Fleischel uh, effect or phenomena. So um, Rajul Sones explained, basically a moving stimulus appears to move slowly when the head and chin are kept still, as opposed to fixating at some point and perceiving motion. And um, the question about this was whether this effect, this phenomena confound confounds the two thirds power law for smooth pursuit. I don't know if that's clear. So I don't, the reason I don't think so is that there have been studies showing big effects on perceived motion. And if there were other reasons for the slowdown that they would have been examined there. I'd have to go back and check maybe someone else here Maybe Gia, you, you remember this, but I believe that there, the illusions of motion that are attributed to the two thirds power law uh, can, would not be explained by, uh, by the slowdown. So I'd have, to, I'd have to go check, but that's where the answer to that question is, is located. Somebody would have, uh, would have worked on that. Yeah. Okay, lovely. There are a few thanks here for a fascinating talk uh, in the chat. And there's another uh, question about the, uh, about, um, the fact that uh, children who know less about the physics of the world, is there a uh -huh. developmental change when, when children actually learn um, the <laughs> physics in their pursuits? Yeah, I think children probably learn physics earlier than I can measure. So, <laughs> uh, so I don't know, but there are of course beautiful studies about infants and what kinds of reasoning they uh, are capable of given, given the physics. So, uh, so yeah, so we have to, uh, that, that again, without the, where you could probably learn this in infants is by studying head movements. There's no easy way to get the precise eye movements. In infants, you could do video, but there's too much head movement. So you may as well just use the head movement from the get-go to find out what they do. And, and I think the, the interesting question underlying this is, does the knowledge you have, is it different depending on the, the motor ex system that expresses it? In other words, could you have a belief about certain things in the physical world, but the motor system just doesn't have access to the belief? On the other hand, can you get the reverse? Are there certain fundamental beliefs that appear earlier in the motor system than they do in uh, your uh, uh, judgment if you are asked to make a judgment about things? Okay, great. Um, Jeremy uh, raised his hand again. If Jeremy is very polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to follow up on that, I, I, I think Ed Vol had a paper showing that um, not, not eye tracking, but uh, motor um, behavior in a sort of a pong game was distinct from 
uh, your beliefs about intuitive physics, but he wasn't using babies either. I really want to see you getting uh, infants on a dual Purkinje eye tracker. I, I, I think well, that on involved. anything basically, but yeah, I will check that. That's good. So but, I will check Gull's paper. Thank you. So, but to back, back to the, uh, the, the flip side of my earlier question. So the earlier question was, can you predict about two things at the same time? Um, the the, the flip question, and it's related to your question about what would happen if you had uh, uh, adequate eye tracking running around in, in the real world. If you're attending to um, one item, uh, does it matter if there's other stuff moving around in the field? I mean, not counting uh, things like it gets in the way and really interferes with it, but, but if you've got other clearly visible targets doing other clearly visible moving things, does that bust up uh, the prediction? No. Okay. No, I mean, basically pursuit, uh, there's an attentional filter for pursuit. It's not perfect. So if you are even uh, having to fixate a stationary point on a moving background, and I've done these, Miriam Spearing has done these experiments, many people have done these experiments, uh, you get a tiny bit filtering in of the other moving targets. You never get 100% uh, a blockage of what you're not attending. And uh, the flip side of this is you can maintain pretty decent pursuit and still make some perceptual judgments about other things, not perfect. So there is the same attentional trade-off that you might see with other kinds of tests. Pursuit is a bit different, but it's an issue. You'd have to have a good reason for studying it and it's gonna be very situational dependent. So the general rule is, yes, you can shift some attention away from pursuit, but you generally have to shift a lot of attention away before you get significant decrements. Um, I see that there are two more comments in the chat. Yeah, um, similar question to the one asked by Sharon, but with a particular uh, addition in 3D motion, would we expect a similar smooth pursuit performance when vergence is also added as a factor? There are, the, the interactions between vergence and version movements are complicated. And they, uh, the, these have been studied in detail by many people over the years. So I, I don't wanna comment casually about this question. It may depend on the trajectory of motion and some of these interactions may be fairly low low level so I, I you know i don't i don't know what the situation is vergence itself is very complicated because it has saccadic and smooth components so uh, uh and and actually oddly enough the role of prediction in vergence was acknowledged very openly well before uh, it it was in pursuit so great question but but not no simple answer to this it will depend on the trajectory of motion of the target um, there are many thanks in the chat, um, and I would also like to thank you again for an interesting and wonderful talk. Um, oh, thank you for and, this for this for this opportunity, and I'm really uh, really happy to uh, see see so many uh, people. And I uh, hello Cha Chen, another uh, Rutgers uh, uh, PhD. And it's good to see you. It's good to see you, and and so many people. Bye. I. I look forward to seeing in person, hopefully yes. in May. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, we all are. We hope that that's the decision you will be reaching and that the corona will allow us to do so. I, it's the corona, you know, it's not, it's not VSS. Yeah. We, you know, who, who expected neuroscience, right? To be, to be canceled. So we don't want to have that, that happen to VSS. Definitely, so Definitely. We are going to be there. Yeah. Thank you so much again and I, next week. I just want to say next week at the same uh, at the same time, uh, Jeremy Professor Jeremy Wolf will be giving oh. us a talk. Uh, so everybody is welcome to join. We'll also uh, distribute and publish that. And yeah, you were about to say something uh, else. So no, sorry. no, no. It's, this is great. I just uh, thank you again. This is really uh, a lot of fun. Lovely. Thank you. The uh, pleasure is all ours. <laughs> thank you very much.